How's it going? Taking another stab at my how I code process. So this is almost, I think, a week later from the last time I opened up this code, and it has that element of surprise to it. Not a big surprise because it's pretty simple, just an HTML file um, with some CSS there at the top and pretty much an empty body and then a pair of script tags at the bottom that has some code which goes and fetches a database from, let me see if I can punch that in here, GitHub. Pause this real quick and find the page. All right. So here it is, this uh, little markdown table from the GitHub site. And it's just a real quick refresher here. It's basically a pipe separated values file, plain text. I can access it at this raw GitHub user content link, which is virtually, excuse me, the same, otherwise the same link as the formatted content. So that's what I've got going on here. And if I were to open this page, um, Sorry about this. I should have had this one open too. GitHub.io, CG. So this is what it looks like, and this is that HTML file we were just looking at in the editor, and it's just doing an AJAX request to pull in that raw table data and then just basically, pretty similarly, reformat it and dump it out. So. When I come in and look at this code, might be a little, maybe a little too small in this browser. Maybe a little bit too zoomed in right here. But anyway, it sort of violates the principle of least astonishment coming in here and looking at it. It You can crawl through it and make sense out of it, what's going on, but it would be a lot nicer if it was a little bit more declarative and some of this ugliness of like, what is this, you know, and like, what's going on here? It's patching some HTML together. If this type of stuff was hidden. But what I did at first was I started out with a monolith, which is, for me, that's 99% of the time or more, that's what I do. Um, especially even with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, because by having them all in one file, you don't have to worry about like if I had it uploaded onto a server or maybe even locally as well, that stuff gets out of sync. It might cache your JavaScript file or cache your CSS file. And then you go make a change in there and you just do a quick refresh on the page and it doesn't pull all that stuff off the server and give you the, the new CSS or whatever it is that you made the change to. But by keeping everything in a monolithic file, you it's just there. If you make a change, it's automatically, it's just, you know, it's bundled in. Everything's bundled in like that. Plus, I can see everything. I can just like whip this little scroll bar. My mouse wheel's broken, but I can just whip this little scroll bar, scroll thumb up and down, and see whatever I need to. You know, I know for me, most of my CSS is going to be in the header, HTML in the middle, JavaScript at the bottom with generic little files that when I start out. So that's sort of my thinking behind that. And uh, it also allows me that once I get like this, once I'm and in any other programming language, if I was just doing JavaScript and I was scrolling this much, then I would think like, okay, maybe I should think about possibly splitting stuff up into multiple files. I wouldn't necessarily probably do it right away, but once I'm breaking like 100 lines, the, stock, the thought starts crossing my mind and I keep checking myself on, you know, looking for a good time that I might take that option. But until then, it's not too much of a cognitive load for the most part. So what I can start doing now is uh, this has sort of reached a critical mass, so to speak, especially at this kind of a zoomed in resolution. I just want to make sure, I, you know, I'm using a 720p and I have my uh, monitor set accordingly. So I have the font blown up just a little bit, 
little bit larger than I'd probably work on it on my own. But anyway, just so to make sure it's legible, ideally. So what I'm, I've got here is I, I put everything in a function and then called it. And uh, I just feel like uh, maybe that's kind of unnecessary there. But I could leave the load table thing there. Hmm. Well, what's going on here is like no matter what, I, it's almost like I'm overthinking it by having this load table thing going. That's sort of jumping the gun. So what I'm going to do is just get rid of all that. I shouldn't even have put it there to begin with. So I pulled out what? I pulled out one thing. Okay, so now I can highlight all this stuff and just give it a good old shift tab. And I'm going to go ahead and just bring it all the way back against the rail like that. I mean, I could indent it, but a lot of times with like HTML, I'll just, and I think a lot of people do it too, is like, you know, in this type of a situation, they'll just, even though that's nested inside of head, we kind of expect the head and body tags and whatever, and it gives us those extra, that little bit of extra space. Anyway, just a little design trade off there, but I'm going to go ahead and bring all that JavaScript back against the rail there, and I'm going to try and order it, if it can be ordered any better here. So I've got, um, I keep having second thoughts about putting it against the rail now. I tend to overthink it. So anyway, I'll just move on. I can always highlight it all and tab it over again. So I'm setting up the crawling through it. I'm setting up the Ajax object. I'm giving it some details on what to call and how to call it. And then I'm sending it off. And then I have this onload function right here. So there's another thing that can probably go off in its own little world, so to speak. So I'll go ahead and give that some double space here to kind of further separate it from the rest of everything. That's a function. So all this is tabbed over, which makes it fairly obvious it's a function. So I'll unload, it's going to call all of that stuff. Now I've started to make some significant changes right now. What's probably best is if I go test this code, because if I start going, okay, that was such a simple change. I don't need to stop and waste my time and test this code. I could have very easily introduced some bugs or whatever. And if I start adding stuff and then I go in and check it and all of a sudden the page is white or all the formatting is just chaotic or something, it's like, uh-oh, when did that happen, right? So best thing to do is just err towards checking things, testing things too much. Okay. So that's the view source on that. I'm going to drag this one over here. And then I can just control F5, get a full reload. And this is the one on my local system here. And it, no noticeable, nothing noticeably out of whack. Seems to still be bringing in the stuff from the remote table. So that's good. Okay, so also ideally pop open a command prompt here. And uh, go ahead and do a get status, which should show me that file's changed. On main branch, did I not save it? I didn't save it. This little asterisk right here is showing me I didn't save it. Definitely something to make sure to do. So I'm going to hit Control S and save that. Come back over here, Control F5 again. Okay, bam, still the same. Good. Now I can come in here get status. We can see there's a change. We'll add that file to track it. Do a git diff on that tracked the cached files. So we can see that stuff slid over there. All right, there's all the changes. So I can quit and say um, git commit refactor. Ajax and then check it out. All right, so that should be good for now. That save that as one little incremental change in there. Okay, so now about making this um, onload function much more readable. So these icons, for now this page is sort of just it's its own one entity. So I really could pull these out and just make them more of like a global 
make this icons list a global variable kind of a list. I'm not sure if I want to do that though. Okay, I've got a bunch of variable declarations there. I could split those off like that. I don't know, it's just really looking ugly. So, think just taking a minute here to think about it. What if you're on the fence about it, one of the things I suggest doing is to go in and like pick comments above anything that looks like gobbledygook. I can't even say that word. Anything that looks like uh like crap, so to speak. So if this icon thing, if I didn't know what it was, I could come in here and put a comment that says like list of material icons, something like that. And then that might help it be a little more understandable what's going on there. Or the other thing to do is just to rename the variable to be a better representation of what it actually is. That's probably the most ideal thing is make the code self-documenting rather than put uh, comments above it like that. And then lines, this response text split on a new line. So basically taking the, the lines of the table we get in and splitting them at the end of the line and turning it into a list of lines. That seems pretty normal. Um, and then I'm setting up the table here. So that's a little bit of a different direction there. Lines table. It's so easy to go on and on with this kind of stuff. I I didn't want to overthink it too much. I wanted to be live with how I'm thinking about it. And there's sort of a trade off there because then I'm not pre-prepared, so to speak, on what exactly I'm going to do. So that's a trade off there. And then the whole pressure of like recording a video at the same time, of course, kind of takes a little bit of a share of the cognitive load. But I'll try not to think about that too much. So I'm creating a table. So this is table. I'm building up this table variable here. So I, th I think with that, what I can really do is everything from then on, I could probably, at least for now, split off into a function. This isn't going to be like a public API interface for anybody tomorrow. It shouldn't be. So I can always come back and refactor it later if I really want to. So I'll get... I'll get just the table building code. I won't do the thing that actually um, has the side effect of changing the table in the HTML document itself. Try and keep the, you know, the side effects separate and very deliberate. And this splitting the text response, I'll go ahead and leave that out as well. And so we'll basically, I'll basically just be sending in the lines into this table and dealing with it like that for now. So what I can do is I can look at what this is. If I were to slap a comment above all that, what am I saying? Like build table, maybe good enough for now. So I'll take that out. I'll put in a call called a uh, build table and pass it lines. And then I will, since it's JavaScript hoisting, I can come right on down here and I can just paste all that stuff out. It's already indented because it was part of that other function. And then I can just say, give it a double space there and say function build table and take one variable called lines, do your thing. All right, we'll save that. So now I should be, I've got the asterisk on. I saved it. I should be able to come over here, control F5. Uh-oh, white page, something went wrong. So one of the first things I can do is I can open the inspection console, control shift I, F12, or right click inspector, and I can jump over to console. Ooh, there's an error, uncaught reference error. Icons is not defined. So that's the easy, the easy route to figure out what's going on there. So icons right here is not defined in that function. Do I want to paste the whole declaration of icons in there or do would I rather just pass them in? That's the question at this point. I don't see any way that I'm going to be using these icons outside of this function for now. Um, I suppose I'll just go ahead and paste them in there. So 
So I'll just paste them in up top like that. Give it a save. Come back over here. Um, Control F5. Slow loading. Cookie has been rejected by third party. Object HTML development. Okay, <laughs> I think I know exactly what's going wrong here, which is no big deal. Trial and error, right? So I'm not returning anything from this function. So I'm building the table, and over here it's trying to uh, do. It's trying to set the HTML to a table that doesn't really exist. There's no table variable. So object HTML div element. That's interesting that it's saying div element, um, which kind of makes sense because there's a div up here. That's what it is. That's that ID, get table by ID. I would think this would be undefined though. So maybe because it's setting that to undefined that it's just automatically, I don't know. It's probably obvious to everybody else, but it's not a big deal. All I need to do is bring back table. Uh, I could either put this whole call, I could just put that right there and return the table. But I kind of like it to be sort of like declarative, um, sort of like procedural over here of what's going on. So I'm just going to go ahead and sign that to ver table. Yeah, it must. Oh, it's because it's trying to pull in maybe a global variable. I don't know. Anyway, setting up a local variable table right there, then that table is going to get built, assigned, and then Right here, I've got var table, another little local variable to that function. And at the end here, I could probably just say return table plus all that, save that, come back over here, control F5, bam, back in business. Okay, so pretty much back to where we were at. And now maybe it's a little more readable in here because I could even get rid of this space. It doesn't make too much sense. Um, even those changes right there, I'll usually jump over and test. I saved it, jump over, control F5, bam, still working, jump back. Okay, so we've got var lines gets the response text split on new lines, then var table gets the results of building the table with those lines, and then we take the document um, div name table by ID and we set its HTML to the return table. Okay, that, that seems a lot better. So now we effectively have, you know, it's like that. That's the Ajax call. So I could even push all that into its own function and call it like process Ajax or, you know, get table or whatever, you know, something like that if I really wanted to. But for now, I'm not going to try and overthink it. I'll just leave it like that for now. If I find myself revisiting this code and I, you know, I keep stumbling over this, then I'll look at how can I clean it up, refactor it, whatever, that kind of a thing. So one last test real quick. Control F5. Make sure I didn't do any changes I forgot about. Looking good. Come over here, do a git diff. Okay. What do we got here? I basically created the build table function, right? It's weird. It's not, it doesn't seem to be picking up those changes, I guess. Maybe I did a little commit that I just forgot about where I'd already refactored it into its own function, I guess, maybe. Um, git log. Refactor Ajax. I guess I could be a little more clear than rather than just refactor Ajax. So anyway, I'll do a git add to track it. Um, git commit. And I'll just say um, add build table function. I might be a little bit off here. Not a good habit. Re maybe I'll just say refactor table building. Refactor table building, table creation, whatever. Okay, get status. Okay, now I can uh, get push, push that upstream onto the web. So now if I basically 
go to this website. Just a little temporary development, sort of a location on the web. I just, GitHub gives a free little GitHub page, as they call it, at your username.github.io. So for stuff like this, I can just add a folder and bam, have my little uh, staging area, I guess you could call it. All right. So that seems to be working good. Do a control U just to kind of double check that those changes actually propagated here. And they didn't. I'm still seeing this. So I think with GitHub, sometimes it takes about five minutes to update. Did this push? Did it complain? Let me try a git push again and it should say nothing. Okay. So those changes didn't go control F5 on that page now. And then uh, control U. Okay, there it went. Just took it a minute, I guess. And we can see there's that build table function refactored. So now it's a little more self-documented. We know that this function is responsible for building a table. And that sticks more to the single responsibility principle, the first S in solid, which I think applies more. It most especially applies, obviously, to object-oriented programming. But even in stuff like this, where this isn't really object-oriented per se, on the surface and I can still use the single responsibility principle just with having a method do one thing and do it well. So that's what's going on there. Now we just know just by looking at that function, I don't even really feel like I need to put a documentation comment above it. It just says build table with lines. I'll usually read that first um, opening brace as like of, with, stuff like that. So build table with lines. And then down here we return the table and I go ahead and tack on this at the same time, which if I really wanted to be a little bit better, I might, you know, add this up here somewhere and then um, just return table by itself to make it very clear that I'm returning that instead of making this whole thing like one little cognitive uh, burp or whatever you want to call it. But anyway, that's not a big deal. It's just sort of like explaining my thought process, like how I might think of it at, at scale, even at a tiny scale like this. Okay, so now I've refactored. I like to refactor, I guess, it seems to be the way I usually do things, is a lot of times if you think of that test-driven development thing. Let me see here. Test-driven so in test-driven development, where's the images? We see this little wheel right here. And very often, I guess they sort of pit it right there. I always felt like it's like write the failing test first is what a lot of people preach. Oh, oh yeah, that one is good. Okay. So they'll say, write a failing test that basically says what you want to do so basically call some interface like build table before you even write build table and then hit compile and run whatever excuse me and you'll get the error like can't find table or whatever and then you go in and make it pass and you do that by writing as little code as possible so i go in write a little tiny function that's just um you know build table return table, whatever, not even enough code to actually build the table. Like if you're really going pure TDD, then that's what you would do. And then you go back in and go, okay, what do I need to do now? And it, it will get you to write more granular tests because you're just writing enough code to get the last test to, to go away, the last failing test. And then you clean up and refactor, and then you write another failing test and so on and so forth over and over and over. Well, what I find myself doing is I refactor first because obviously I'm not following a strict TDD because I haven't even written a test. I'm obviously jumping back and forth doing manual tests. So what I'll do is I'll go in because I have some code, I'll set up some skeleton, right? And then I'll refactor. Then I'll test that refactor and then I'll add some code to do something refactor. So that's kind of where I tend to jump in the wheel uh, in the book, like, uh, what is it? Martin Feller, I think he wrote refactoring 
and he has like five or more different types of refactors. I don't think it's really worth like trying to be like super academic about it and think of like, oh, what type of refactoring am I doing or whatever. It's just, but it is sort of a preparatory, has the effect of being a preparatory refactoring. Okay. So now that I've cleaned it up a little bit, I can, you know, I basically like dusted off the, uh, the foundation there and now I can chalk out my new lines, so to speak, like construction terms. And what I want to do, what I said I would do last time is I would go in here and I would do something with these little, uh, markers there, because if we come over here, they're superscript, go ahead and inspect those. So they're, uh, they're a superscript a sup tag and then there's an uh, hyperlink an anchor right here down to that other content whatever so at the very least if I just made them a superscript that would probably be a lot better so I can there's that what's the difference between these this one's online okay I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of the online one just to keep stuff simple for a minute So when I'm building the table, what I want to do is if I come in here and kind of crawl through this, another thing about like code smells and refactoring, if I find myself continually visiting this, then I might consider further breaking stuff out into more declarative like sub functions, so to speak. But the first time or two or three or whatever it's not a huge deal i if i can just crawl through it make it happen maybe i'll never have to come back and look at this code and it can just be its own little pile off in the corner that whatever but it's the code the more like you basically count strikes against it so to speak like the more you visit that code or at least me i'm speaking for myself um the more i visit that code the more strikes it gets and the more i'm like okay i I really should clean this up because I could really be making things easier for myself, less bug prone, saving time in the long run, all that. So if we come in here, it's it's going to be in that header. So if we get to, here's table header, I'm seeing TH. So right here, if I did some processing and check, where am I doing? Line split, four, row length. So my brain's locking up on me right now. It doesn't want to see what's really going on. Okay, so I have a table. I'm starting the whole table. I'm starting a row. Um, one thing I've learned is you just go back line by line if you have to, especially when you're, like, I felt like I kind of almost had a good pace going for a second, um, and I, I don't want to, like, slow down and, like, read every line, but really that's what it is a lot of times is just, uh, walk, don't run, right? Turn on that venture song, I guess. So, fair row, lines, splitting the lines by the pipe. Okay, that makes sense. And then, that's giving me a row, so I'm inside of a loop right here, obviously. Am I? How, how is that not a loop? Oh! That's the header. I'm doing a one-off thing right there. And then down here, I'm splitting them in a loop. Okay. So I do that, and then when I get in here, I'm effectively processing the row. So how could I comment that to make me not stumble over it in the future? Less likely to stumble over it. So I could just say display row even though it's not technically displaying it yet um, process row I don't know I can always change it so I'll just say process header header row okay it's good enough for me and then I come down here I'm not using a curly brace there to save a little bit of syntax which is kind of scary but I do that from time to time. Um, so I come in here, I'm building up the table, which is just has that. I'm adding the header. Class material icon. Oh, 
Okay, and there's the row. Then I'm adding the row. Okay, so before I do all this, I could prepare the row, or I could just say, like, um, check row for what? What am I doing there? I'm checking check row for superscript. Um, bad name. I'm not in a good naming mode right now. But like I said, it's not a public API, so I could just do whatever I want. So this is sort of like manual test driven development. If you think of it, I'm like check row for superscript. What I really should be doing if I was doing test driven development is write a test that's trying to call check row or check cell for superscript or whatever, and then so on and so forth. But I'm not going to go that route right now. So I'll just say check cell for superscript way too long of a name in my opinion I could probably chop that down to half the size but until I figure out a better name I'm just gonna do it check it for superscript and then I'm gonna have to pass it the row so row I and then am I gonna, gonna get back that row okay so when I get back that row technically this is JavaScript it's a dynamic programming language so if I want I could just literally overwrite it I mean to each their own on how they feel about that but right here I have the rows coming in this is one reason I'm against const and all that is I'd rather just I don't why should I have to like declare another variable right here I could it's a trade-off it's a design decision but I can also just mutate that variable and that's arguably that's what pure object oriented programming is really about um, being very dynamic and late binding and all that good stuff that Primarily L and K sort of uh, framed it up as. So anyway, I'm just going to mutate the row. I'm passing it the row, and then when it gets back, it's going to be mutated to my liking. And then I don't even have to change any of this code down here. You know, this, let's say I'd used row I like a thousand times or something. I don't have to go through and um, search and replace all that text. So that's one potential benefit of it. Always trade-offs, right? So check cell for superscript row. So then I need to come over here, copy this. I'm going to have to create a uh, a function for that, right? And since it's JavaScript, I usually just go downward. Um, normally with a lot of traditional programming languages, obviously you either have to like declare a prototype up at the top for a function, or you have to declare that function like before it gets called. But in JavaScript, it performs hoisting so why not just make the the functions kind of just drop out in more of a logical order okay so function and then in function we I will just call it row singular and uh, save that so check cell for superscript row so what do I need to do to find that superscript so if it contains that little opening uh, bracket which is probably um, JS uh, index of. I can't even remember if that's the best choice or not. I like W3 schools. It's usually my first go-to, and then if I need more details, I'll go to MDN or other places. So right here we can see here's a bunch of string functions. Handy dandies. So there's character at, character code, uh, index of which should return a negative one. If we come down here, you can see there's like a, they create a text string with this string in it. It has a text index of welcome uh, lowercase or welcome uppercase. So the index of method returns the position of the first occurrence or returns a negative one if it's not found. It is case sensitive. Also look at last in index of. So what we can do is say if Oh, it's got to be string dot index of so row dot index. It's a method, not a function, right? Index of this thing is uh, not equal to negative one, or I could say greater than negative one, maybe greater than negative one. Then what? Then I'll have that location. 
I'll have that location of it and I can say slice no extracts part of the string and do a new string split probably not going to end up picking the most optimal thing right away but I'm just trying to get results right now um, splits the string into an array of substring returns don't want to do that we're splice Trim value up to uh, last. Ten. How am I not seeing it? Um, JS splice string slice method. Is that extracts parts of the string and returns the extracted parts in a new string? Start and end to specify the string you want to extract. Okay. Is that up to but not including? First character has a position 0, second character has a position 1. Use a negative number to select from the end of the string. From position 3 to end, from position 3 to 8. Only the first character. Okay, so it's up to and not including. Starting at index 0, up to 1, but not including it. Okay. So I can come over here. Um and say so this is if it does find that square bracket since right now I don't have to get super crazy I know that um, that that square bracket is only going to occur you know what I mean so I don't need to use any funky regex expressions or anything too complex I can just keep it really primitive and say uh, if we're in here then we found it and we'll say row dot slice starting at what I'm going to do here I guess I could say uh, ver bracket this is kind of cramming it in I don't think it's a good idea ver bracket I'll just say ver index and then say we'll start at that index no we'll start at zero Go up to but not including that index. Should I call it left bracket index? That's too long. I'll just call it left bracket. Left bracket. Left bracket. Up to but not including that left bracket. Slice it and concatenate that with row dot slice. Um, from the left bracket, so from the left bracket plus one, two, three, four. So the left bracket plus four is what we want. And since they're all single digits, they're all going to be four for now. So I don't think, I don't foresee that being necessarily a huge deal. If I need to come back, I can write more tricky code there if I add so many subscripts or superscripts that it becomes a you know that I get in a double digit territory or something okay so row slice starting at left bracket plus four to the end of the string so I should just be able to leave it like that and I'll go up here and do I want to just return that I think I just want to return that then I'll return that And otherwise, I'll just return the plain old row it was fine to begin with. I think that should work. Did I call this? So I said check cell for superscript. Come back up here where I'm checking cell, overwriting with itself. Okay, in theory that should work. What I'm doing here is I'm testing. Um, like I said, this kind of, this code's a little bit crammed. Really, I probably should declare this variable right before the if statement, whatever. Um, but yeah, what's going to happen, it's going to start over here and it's going to say, if this left bracket is not negative one, it's great, you know, it will give me an index of zero or 10 or wherever it's at, then 
whatever index it's at, save it here in this left bracket variable. Could be a negative one, which means it isn't there. But it's saying if it's greater than a negative one, then go ahead and process this. So return the um, the first part of the row up to but not including that left bracket and then concatenate onto that starting just past that left bracket all the way to the end and return that new row with that effectively spliced out. Otherwise, uh, we didn't see a bracket, so just go ahead and return the same old row. Should be relatively quick code there. I'm not going to hang up our, you know, not going to bog down our system. These are more legible. All right, so I've saved it. I'm going to come back over here, make sure I'm on my local, and I'm going to hit Control F5. Ooh, something went wrong. Not a big surprise. Uh, console syntax error. Expected expression got keyword bear. Okay, getting a little ahead of myself down here. So I'll just go ahead and what will I do? I'll take this. Go control. Can't I assign? Oh, you know what? I did wrong. I I think if I wrap this in here. I don't know if I can declare it as a variable. Um, save that. Let's try it out. Okay, got the var keyword. So it's mad about the var keyword. Okay, since I do want to use var, um, I'll go ahead and copy that out of there. And I think I need to leave it in the parentheses anyway. And I'll just say var left bracket, something like that. Save it. Jump back over here. And bam. Well, a little bit of progress. So now there's an undefined here. So what's going wrong? Check cell for superscript. Maybe I shouldn't be trying to overwrite row. Okay, what I'm doing here is I'm overwriting that cell. It's checking the cell for superscript but I'm returning a whole row. This should be a cell actually to word it better. Cell slice. Could use a text search and replace to get this. I know this is kind of taking long. As soon as I get to a successful stopping point, I'll, I'll end this one. So check cell for superscript. Um, that cell part's redundant. So we can do check for superscript with cell or in cell or whatever. Check for superscript. That's already shortening that name. Okay, it's going to come down here. It's going to assign it back to that row I. That's not right because that's going to overwrite the whole row. Right? No. It's going to overwrite that one index value in that row. Row length. This takes me more than a minute. I'll pause it. Table plus that. Okay, what we can do is come over here and just look at the source. See what we're getting. Or it won't let me, will it? I can inspect it, though. Okay. Should be able to open the inspector. Come over here. Uh break this table open, see, okay, table row, table row, table header, so we're getting an undefined there, uh, we're getting material icons undefined, VR undefined, is there something going on with the icons then? Icons, I should just be give right here. That should just be giving a string out of there. That's effectively going in there. Um, I could throw in a console log. And just see what row I looks like, which this should be. I think it would be all good. Okay, save. Come back over here. And look at the console. It's already undefined. Am I not returning it? What's going on? Check for superscript row I. Passing in row I. And then over here, return cell. Return cell. Da, 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 da. 
what am I not seeing here? Index of, maybe that's all too tricky anyway. I should just do uh, cell dot um, index of down here. Not trying to get rid of that cleverness. Left bracket, make it more readable at the same time. Um, index of, okay, save that. Expected token identifier, missing semicolon. What line was that on? Missing semicolon on uh, 7521. 75 left bracket equals. All right, back to that point. Cookie has been rejected as third party. Is that part of the problem? So maybe those, maybe part of the problem is possibly that the, something's getting messed up with those. I don't know. Um, I'm going to pause it so I don't eat up any more time and then I will try and figure it out. Okay. I think I got it. <laughs> it's the dumbest. It's always the dumbest thing, right? Um, proof in the pudding that you really should use curly braces. I really should use curly braces right there. What I had done was I added row, I guess. I just now noticed it, so I unpaused it. Um, I went in and sprinkled in like a half dozen console logs to check the values of all this stuff and make sure that it was what it was supposed to be, and it was. Everything was what it was supposed to be. So I was like, what is going on here? And then I was thinking, am I stuck in that using the ver keyword in a for loop and maybe something? And then I looked up here, I was like, wait a minute. I added this into that for loop and I hadn't, I got lazy and didn't use the curly brace. So it's running this thing, for looping it over itself a bunch. And then it's trying to do like one table cell and that one comes back undefined and that's apparently what's going on. So I could do that and I could come down here and should be able to put this right there. I like to try and include a space usually after any sort of blocks, even if the curly brace is already eating up a space. I'll usually still try and do it most times. Okay, let me see. Now I save that, come back over here, control F5. Bam, it's back. The little bracket thing's gone. Stock options, bonus, 401k. Looks a little bit cleaner, I feel like. Um, it looks like there could be some padding. That one's brushed up right against the edge of the table cells there. So I would probably give that some padding. It looks like it's squeezing it in tight because it's just giving it just enough work space to fit in that base salary. And then everything down here has except for this, of course, has plenty of space. Okay, so uh, anyway, I would add some padding to that. I don't want to tinker with that right now because I've already ate up like 45 minutes of 48, 49 minutes. So this is going on 50 minute recording. But anyway, that is that spot. Everything looks good. I'll check the console. Um, before I mess with the padding, the console looks clean other than this weird cookie thing. I think Firefox is a tiny bit overzealous on some of that stuff. Not that it's a bad thing, but I'm not too worried about that one. So I can come over here, get diff, and we can see all that. So I'm, that reminds me, okay, I've removed the superscript. So I'll say, uh, get, uh, track those things. Oop. Uh oh, get status. Everything's looking good so far, so I'll do a git uh, commit, and I'll say um, remove. Oh, I didn't want to remove the whole superscript, did I? I forgot. So what I should have done is I actually should have gone in, huh, got ahead of myself there, but for now I don't even care. Um, I'll go fix it on, an, on the next iteration. But what I should have done is in here, I should have got rid of the left bracket 
then added another little plus thing right here in the middle and just extracted that maybe what I would have I don't know maybe the easiest thing to do would just be starting right there um, just inject a superscript tag like just say starting right there then go from uh, inject the superscript tag and then start right at that left bracket again right after that superscript tag continue until the plus four and then close the superscript tag and then add the rest of the string and that would still leave that little i think it's called the carrot the little up arrow thing um or i could even get trickier and remove the up arrow but anyway you get the gist thanks a lot for watching oh yeah i gotta go ahead and commit remove super scripts and that's that. And then I can do a git push. Or what I would do probably is like what a git pull rebase. But it probably won't let me because I have. Uh... Yeah, it's already up to date. Okay, cool. So I can do a git push. And then I will push that upstream. Jump over here. Grab uh, just that. And do a new tab. Paste it. That might have been too quick. It's still in there. Let's hit Control F5 and see if it's gone. Still there. If I just give it like literally a minute, I think it would go away. Um, just keep hitting Control F5. Whatever. Thanks for watching.